We are in this week in Barashat Chayi Sara, which uh, we know that when Sarah died, Avraham Avinu was extremely, extremely sad and disappointed, and and uh, he gave a great farewell for Sarah, and that was by writing a poem to her, the, his eulogy, which is of course Eshet Chayil, and many people attribute it to Shlomo Amelech because it's found in the book of Mishlei. But really, it's Avraham Avinu's poem. He wrote it for the, for the death of Sarah. Later on, Shlomo Melech added it as part of his book, Mishlei Proverbs. And, but nevertheless, the whole poem, the, the eulogy of Chay of, uh, of Eshet Chayil, has great meanings behind it. And we sing it every Friday, and most people don't even know what they're singing. But nevertheless, I think it's most appropriate in the week of Chayei Sara to learn a little bit about Eshet Chayil, what it means. Needless to say, when we're uh, learning the, and teaching the ladies, so the ladies need to be appreciated much more than they are. Uh, before I even start, I just wanted to uh, add that this week is also a very auspicious week for the ones who want to find uh, Shiduch, the other half. Because uh, this is the week that Avraham Avinu sends Eliezer ah, to get Rivka. This is the first Shiduch in the Torah. Ah. So this, in this week's parasha is the first business transaction, the first real estate uh, purchase, and the first Shiduch. And there's a lot of beautiful mystical reasons behind this whole Shiduch. Why Eliezer went with ten camels, why he gave the, the gold uh, uh, nose ring and the bracelets and everything. So maybe we'll get to do that maybe in a different class. But this is a very powerful week for anyone who needs to find the Shiduch, is to prayer and to, to create a spiritual vessel for that. And if you know somebody that needs to find their other half, they can pray for them. And it's also Shiduch and marriage is always the same thing. So the ones who need a little bit of a jump start in their marriage, it's also a good week for that. But nevertheless, it's a very powerful week for finding your other half. And uh, sometimes some people have, they're married to their other half, but they still didn't find them. So that's also, you need to find. You can marry, be married to somebody for 50 years and not realize that that's your other half and, and not appreciate the other half. And there, that's where Rashid Chayil comes in, because Avraham Avinu, he knew the prize he had. He knew exactly who Sarah is. And... Uh, there's a saying that behind any successful man there's a great woman. So Avraham Avinu is the perfect example because he was a very successful individual. And Sarah was kind of in the background, but Avraham Avinu knew that everything is in the merit of Sarah. And he knew that she's much greater than him. And when she died, it was sudden. Uh, because if you remember Sunday's class, I, re I explained that Avraham Avinu went with uh, Yitzhak to the Akedah. And on the way back, the Satan went to her and uh, knocked on the door, pretending he's some uh, visitor. He looked like an old man, and he told her, where's uh, Avram? She says, I don't know. He went with Yitzchak. I don't know. Maybe they went fishing. So he says, what are you? Uh, you're not connected to this world? You don't see CNN? You don't have a Facebook page? Don't you know what happened? Avram Avinu went to sacrifice Yitzchak. Everybody knows. It's on the WhatsApp group. So she heard that news and she collapsed because thinking of the, just the thought that Avraham Avinu was sacrificing Yitzchak and she died. Avraham Avinu comes home all excited. He passed his final test and he hears the shocking news that his wife died. So needless to say right away he prepares the burial and then he writes his eulogy. Now since Avraham Avinu doesn't have a book, later on Shlomo Melech took it, he added to the book of Mishlei, this can be found in chapter 31, and it's not from the beginning because it's part of the chapter, so it starts at, chapter, at uh, verse 10 and ends at verse 31. Uh, if you notice, the, the verses in Eshet Chayil, they go by the Aleph Bet. Eshet Chayil Mimtza, Batach Balev Baala, Right, you follow? So every letter, every verse is, is another Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit. The verses go through the alphabet, so the 22 verses. And there is a Midrash, specifically Al-Kuchimoni, that says 
the reason why it's specifically 22 letters, nothing happens by chance, is because the same way that Kadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah with 22 letters, the Torah is written in 22 letters, therefore Avraham Avinu, we know that he fulfilled the entire Torah before even receiving it, so he wanted to praise his wife with 22 letters, exactly like the Torah. And needless to say that Avraham Avinu is our father, so our sages say, Maaseh avot siman lebanim, the actions of the father should be assigned to me, so fathers and husbands have to understand that the same way that the Torah is precious to us, us then uh, the wife should be as precious to us. Now, there are so many interpretations of this psalm, the psalm, the eulogy, we can make a couple of classes about it, so I chose a few of them, and we'll go, not quickly, but we'll go a little bit in interpreting the verses. But nevertheless, there are many more. There's different midrashim, because there's some midrashim on uh, the, the parashat Chayei Sarah, and then there's midrashim on Mishlei, and there's midrashim uh, uh, on different verses that there's so much information about it. Uh, the whole eulogy starts in a question. Eshet Chayel means the woman of uh, greatness. But right away it says, Mim It starts with a question, who's going to find such a woman? Avraham Avinu, he realized the prize that he had, and after he buries Sarah, he says, wow, such a woman, who can find such a woman? She's an unbelievable woman, uh, 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 in a level that nobody can understand. And it starts right away after the question, saying, Batachba lev ba'ala. Her husband trusted her. Batach means he trusted, ba in her, Lev Ba'ala, the heart of her husband. He had unbelievable trust in her. And this is where we learn that a husband is obligated in supporting the wife. I mean, when we look through a ketubah, um, most people don't look at their ketubah, neither less don't even know how to read the ketubah. But nevertheless, you know, a few months ago I was in Los Angeles and I was invited there to officiate a wedding. It was a beautiful wedding, very special wedding. And before we read the Ketubah, I, I said, let's translate the Ketubah, because nobody knows what it says here. The Chatan is about to sign, the witnesses are about to sign, everybody's smiling, the photographers, but nobody knows what we're signing. <laughs> so, we gave a very quick explanation, a translation, what it says there. And after that, I looked at the Chatan, I said, you, are you agreeing with this? Because uh, maybe you don't even know what you're signing. But nevertheless, the Ketubah says very clearly, that the husband has to take care of the wife's needs. He has to clothe her, he has to take care of her financially, physically, emotionally, everything. So from there, batach balev ba'ala is where we learn that the husband has to provide the needs for the wife. Now, one interpretation, there are so many ways of looking, of different ways to interpret what is this eshet chayl? Is it Sarah? Is it any woman? Is it maybe other women? I mean, there are great women other than Sarah. She's not the only great one. We had amazing women in our past too. So there's a few ways of looking at it. One way is interpreting that the Eshet Chayl is not even a woman. It goes in the Torah. The Torah is that amazing woman. Mm -hmm. That the Eshet Chayl, I mean, we know the Torah is in a female tense. And the Torah is a manifestation of the Malchut. So the Eshet Chayil is referring to the Torah, it's not even talking about a woman. And again, this is one interpretation, doesn't mean the others are not valid. When it says in the, one of the verses, Rachok mi pninim michra, pninim is pearls, and there's different types of metals that are very, very expensive, gold and platinum, and there's different precious stones, can be diamonds and water rubies. But uh, uh, pearls are not only that they're valuable, they're also very beautiful. And it says, Rachok mi pninim michra, the value is way, you can't even uh, evaluate it if you're taking the value of, of a pearl, it's way above a pearl. Rachok, Rachok means that there's no even comparison. So the Torah is so dear and so precious that it's, you can't even value it in any type of price. And not only that, it, why is it using pearls and not diamond or a ruby? Because a pearl is hidden in a shell. You can't find the pearl. I mean, some people, what they do is they scuba dive and they start taking up shells and opening. Maybe they'll find that beautiful pearl that they're waiting for. The same way the Torah was very, very concealed. 
Nobody knew about the Torah for so many years, for thousands of years. Who knew about the Torah? And finally, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to go up to the mountain and to bring it down into the world and to, uh, to expose it. Very equivalent to a pearl. <coughs> and another verse that says, Batach Balev Bala, her husband trusted her, Veshalal Lo Yechsar, she doesn't lack anything. Again, goes again on the Torah, the, the Torah is a great prize, and nothing, not, you're not missing anything in the Torah. The Torah has every, everything in it. Any wisdom you want, you'll find in the Torah. There's no such a thing that exists in the world that doesn't exist in the Torah. Shalal lo yichsar, nothing lacks in the Torah. So this is one way of interpreting Eshet Chayil, that Eshet Chayil is referring to the Torah. Uh, but this is one way. Let's go to a different type of interpretation, that it is talking about Sarah. Because Avraham Avinu is the one who sang it to Sarah. Just imagine the, the funeral. Uh, you know, here in this world, a president or a king dies. Ooh, all the leaders of the world come and uh, they make a whole big uh, show out of it. So imagine the funeral of Sarah. Avraham Avinu is a great man. Everybody came to pay their respects. And Avraham Avinu is standing there and utilizing her. So when it says, Batach Balev Bala, her husband had uh, uh, trusted her, it's referring to Sarai Menu in this type of interpretation, this Midrash, and it says that Avraham Avinu became rich because of her. Avraham Avinu, in our terms, was like a gazillionaire, a Bill Gates or I don't know what, who's the richest man in the world right now, the guy from Amazon, I think, what's his name? I think he now take the, took the first place. But you know, here a billion, there a billion. Uh, uh, who counts? But nevertheless, Avraham Avinu, if it would be in our generation, Avraham Avinu would be in the top uh, 10 uh, richest people in the world, if not the one of the most richest person. And he, he got his wealth because of Sarah. And how do we know that? It says in the book of Bereshit, we just read that last week, chapter 12, and it says, Vehitiv ba'avura. He got uh, uh, rewarded because of her. So all the, everything that he got was because of Sarah. So when it says, Batach Balev Bala, Avram knew, you are my, uh, I don't know want to say an omen, or my good luck charm, but Avram Avinu says, you are, you, it's because of you. You brought all this wealth. There is a verse, the verse, this is the, the second verse, Batach Balev Bala, but the, the third verse, which would be verse 13, it says, Gamalat Uto Velora. This is referring to Rivka Imeno. So in this type of interpretation, this is a different Midrash. The first Midrash I, that we read, it's saying the Eshet Chayil is referring to the Torah. A different Midrash is saying, it's not only Sarah, it's all the great women in our history. And we're going to go now one by one, which one of them. So, Batach Balev Bala, the first verse, that's referring to Sarah, because Avraham Avinu trusted her twice, uh, blindly, and more, more, more than that, she was the source of wealth, and he became rich because of her. Gemalat Huto Velora, this referring to Rivka. Why? Because when Sarah died, Yitzhak was not a little boy, he was 37 years old. When he went to the Akedah, people think he was like a little boy, he was an adult, he was 37 years old. But he was very attached to his mom. And when Sarah died, Yitzchak was very, very upset, very lost. And then Rivka came right away. But Rivka was a little girl when she came. She was three, three years old. But the fact that she came, it calmed him down. It uh, relaxed him. Okay, there's going to be a replacement. So when Rivka came and replaced Sarah, we're going to talk about it later, how I'm sure you all know that when Sarah died, the cloud of glory disappeared from the tent, the chala wasn't fresh anymore, the candle wasn't lit up anymore. When Rivka came back, it all returned. So, Gemalat Uto Velora, this refers to Rivka Imeno. Then the next verse, verse the, the fourth verse, but it will be verse Yud Gimel, 13, it says, Darshat Tzemer Ufishtim. This is referring to Lea Imeno. Lea, it says that when uh, uh, Yaakov came from the field, she accepted him with a, with a great welcoming. And it says, Kibla If you remember the story that when Yaakov came from the uh, field, this can be found in, in the book of Bereshit, chapter 30, and, uh, and, and she gave him a very good greeting. And that night he spent with her, and then she had another child. 
So Darshat Semer of Ishtim, this is referring to Leah Imenu. That Leah Imenu was also a great, a great woman. The next verse, verse 14, Aitako Niat Zohar, she was like a merchant ship. This is referring to Rachel. Why? Because Rachel was uh, very embarrassed for the fact that she didn't have kids. All the rest of the, the I mean Leah and the maidservants had kids. And just imagine a year after a year after a year after a year and she's the only one who doesn't have kids and she was embarrassed. Every day she was embarrassed. But the interpretation, why is it says Haitakoniat Soher, she was like a merchant a ship, a merchant ship. Because from Rachel, when she finally got uh, uh, had a child, it was Yosef. And Yosef, if you remember, when he went to Mitzrayim, he was the one who was in charge of all the food in the world. Because Mitzrayim was the only country that had food, and everybody had to come to Mitzrayim to get food, and he was in charge of it. And this is like a merchant ship, that he has all the storages, all the, the, the food, and he's controlling it. So Rachel, as much as she was crying for so many years for not having a child, finally when Hashem rewarded her with a child, he rewarded her with not just a child, but rather Yosef Atzadik. That he was able to sustain and to nourish the entire world in his great wealth and his great knowledge. Next verse is verse 15, the Dvav, Vatakam Be'od Laila, and she woke up late at night. This is referring to Batya, Batya the daughter of Paro. And Batya was a non-Jew, she was the daughter of Paro, but she later on became a Jew. She converted, and not only that, she was, her name was mentioned in the list of the women that are very special and righteous. And when the, the, the list was read, so we're reading now Sarah and Rivka and Leah and Rachel, what do we know, we're reading also about Batya. Why? Because Batya, she saved Paro, she saved Moshe, sorry. Uh, she didn't have to do it. She didn't even know who's Moshe. Mm -hmm. But she saved him. And she saved him. So she, the reward that she got, she, was, and she entered Gan Eden while she was alive. Like Eliyahu Navi. So she got a great reward. She's marked as one of the uh, great women in the history. So Vatakam Bodlaila refers to Batya. Next verse, verse 16. Zamama Sadevet Ikacheo. She desired the field and she took it. This is referring to Yocheved. Yocheved was the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu. Don't need to explain too much. She was the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu. Well, there's nothing more to, more to add here. The, the mother of the Redeemer and the, the, the great uh, teacher that brought the Torah down to the world. Verse 17, Chagra Be'oz Matnea, that she uh, tied the, the belt around her waist very strongly. This is referring to Miriam. Why Miriam? When Miriam was a little girl, she had a prophecy that her mother will give birth to the Redeemer of Israel. Now just imagine the house of Aaron, Miriam, and Moshe. They're walking around there. In a normal house, you see a three-year-old and she's, uh, you know, playing a uh, kitchen or with a Barbie doll. And here you have kids, they're walking around the house with prophecies. <laughs> so this little girl comes and says, Mommy, do you know you're going to give birth to a boy and he's going to redeem us? Now, they're like, okay, great, that's great news. But then what happened, Moshe was born, and around the time that Moshe Rabbeinu was born, it became worse, the slavery became worse. So her father, uh, Amram, he got very upset, and the Midrash says that he slapped her, like he patched her on her head, and he spit in her face, and he says, that's your prophecy? that now he's coming to redeem us, it's became worse to us. Where's your prophecy right now? So Miriam did anything she could to make sure that Moshe Rabbeinu will survive and become the redeemer. And it says, hey, we're going to read that very soon in a few months. We're not so far away from the book of Shemot. What does it say there? This is in the second chapter of Shemot. It says, Vatitzav achoto merachok. When they put Moshe Rabbeinu in the little basket and they put it in the river, she stood there. She was looking around, what's going on? She was there, to, uh, uh, ha she had his back, as they say. So because she put so much effort, he was able to survive and he was able to grow and to become a redeemer. Therefore, Chagra Be'oz, Oz is might and a lot of uh, uh, courage. So this is referring to Miriam. Now chapter 18 is Ta'amaki Tov Sacha, she has tasted how good and well is her product. 
This is referring to Hannah. And why Hannah? Hannah didn't have children also. And she tasted the taste of success of prayer. Because she prayed, and through her prayer, she was able to have a child, but not just a child, a very special child, a prophet, Shmuel the prophet. That it says that Shmuel was so great, he was as powerful as Moshe and Aaron together. So that's where you see the power of prayer. That prayer can do anything. And with the power of prayer, you can convince the Kadosh B'chut to turn the world around. We kind of push away prayers. Ah, I don't feel like it. I did it already yesterday. <laughs> so we usually tend to, to not to pray. But here we have a proof that the power of prayer, just sit and pray to the Kadosh B'chut. And uh, of course many question, how can you say that the Shmuel was greater than Aaron and Moshe together? So there's a Midrash on Tehilim, specifically Tehilim Tzadik Tet, which is 99. And it says, Moshe and Aaron Moshe and Aaron were the heads of the priests. Ushmuel bekorei Shmo. And Shmuel was above to all the ones who calling in the name of Hashem. The Midrash explains that Shmuel was greater than uh, Moshe and Aaron together. Then the next uh, uh, verse, uh, Yutet 19. Uh, her hands she put in the weaving uh, system Kishor is what the, the, this system that you put the, the threads to weave this is referring to Yael Yael unfortunately is not, uh, doesn't have enough credit in our history but Yael was a certain individual a woman, a very brave woman who killed Sisra and she decided to kill him with her own hands not with a sword, not with an axe, not with anything else. Rather, with her own hands, she killed him. Needless to say, she, she, she did a great miracle. There was a great miracle. She saved everybody. But why did she want to do it with her own hands? Because there is a prohibition in the Torah that says, Lo uh, gever alisha. A male a garment should not be dressed on a woman. A man cannot be dressed as a woman, and a woman cannot be dressed as a man. When a lot of ladies, they have a question why they have to be wearing dresses. I heard many times women telling, you know, some of the dresses are so tight and so short, or they're worse. Don't I look more modest when I wear pants? The pants are big, they don't show the curves, and I think it's much more modest. So the pants has nothing to do with modesty. The pants is called kligevel. Uh, you're right, there are some dresses that uh, I know many women, unfortunately, that they wear a dress, but the dress you can see every wrinkle on the body. So the, the pants is not necessarily for modesty, rather for not wearing a male uh, garment. So when the Torah says, Lo alisha kligever, that a woman should not wear anything that is, is manly. So here, Yael didn't want to use a tool that a man uses, like a knife or a sword, so she killed him with, his, with her own hands. So Yadea Shalcha Bakisho, Yadea means her hands, she choked him, she, she strangled him. So this refers to Yael. Uh, and the last one, excuse me? Sisra. 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 Another time we'll do a class in Tanakh, but uh, this is a story from the Tanakh. And... Uh, no, no, Yael was a woman and she killed Sisra. Sisra was a king. He was a general a king. But nevertheless, the next verse is, chapter, is verse uh, 20. Kapa parsa le'ani, her hands she gave out to a poor person. Who is that uh, referring to? There was a widow woman. Uh, her, she was known as Ha'almana Hatzarfit. This woman she helped Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi wasn't so popular, by the way. Usually the great ones are not popular. So Eliyahu Navi, you would think that he would, everybody would uh, love him and adore him. And uh, he was uh, uh, not popular at all. Everybody wanted to kill him. He was constantly prosecuted and had to hide. And look at David the Melech. You would think that David the Melech would be popular. He wasn't so popular. And uh, many others. You know, just the other day we were learning something about Rabbi Nachman from Breslev. People now, oh, say Rabbi Nachman, thousands and thousands of people are, are following him blindly. When he was alive, you think he was popular? Psst. Nobody liked him. 
So, and the same thing with the Baal Shem Tov and many others. The, the Arizal, when the Arizal came to Tzfat, you think somebody liked him? Who liked him? This young man coming now and uh, proving everybody and showing that everybody is less than him. So usually the, the popular one, the great ones are not so popular. So Eliana V was not popular. So at some point he was uh, uh, prosecuted and he had to hide. And there was a certain woman, she was known as the widow Hatzarfit. And she gave him water and bread, she hid him. And the, the verse, Kapapar Salani, her hands, she gave to a poor person. This is referring to uh, this woman who gave Eliyahu Navi uh, bread and water. So we see here a different, a beautiful different interpretation uh, from a different Midrash that uh, Eshet Chayel is not only for Sarah, but rather for another long group of, uh, a long list of a group of women. <coughs> Going back to the original text, how do we know that the Eshet Chayel is from Avraham? I mean, most people, up until a couple of years, I also thought that it's Shlomo HaMelech that wrote it. How do we know that it's uh, coming from Avraham? It doesn't say in the Torah. So in the same book of Mishlei, chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Eshet Chayel Ateret Baala. Eshet Chayel is the crown of her husband. And this is referring to Avraham Avinu, whose Baala? Is Avraham Avinu that he gave, uh, he cried a lot and he gave a beautiful eulogy to his wife. And that's going, talking about Avraham Avinu writing the, the eulogy to Sarah. Now, when Avraham Avinu said the word Eshet Chayl, of course he referred to, to Sarah. And it says, if you remember when the first time when they went to Mitzrayim, then uh, he got to the border of Mitzrayim, he saw already the immigration standing there with the machine guns, and he was like, oh my gosh, now I'm going to have a problem with the immigration. I don't have a green card, and I don't have a visa. What are they going to do? Now they're going to see Sarah, this gorgeous woman, and they're going to take her and kill me. So he hid her in a trunk. And of course they opened the customs, they opened everything, and they, what do you mean? What is this? A beautiful woman here. So he told her, just tell them you're my sister. But nevertheless, it, when he approached Egypt, he said, oh my gosh, now they're going to see this gorgeous woman and they're going to take her and kill me. And he says, Ataya dati ki yafat mareat. Now I know that you are beautiful. Oh, where were you the last 50 years, Abraham? Well, you know when they went to Mitzrayim? He was at least 75 years old because it was after living in Rukasdim. So now you figured out that she's beautiful? You married at least 50 years. I mean, there is a Gemara, there is a Talmud in Sanhedrin that says that Abraham Avinu married Sarah when she was very, very young. Now we're reading about Yaakov and uh, Yitzchak and Rivka. Rivka was three years old. So we don't know exactly how old Sarah was when they got married, but we do know, based on the Talmud, that she was very, very young. So now you notice that she's beautiful. Where were you for the last 50, 60 years, Mr. Abraham? So of course, there's different interpretations, different commentary says that uh, he was... She was so modest that she, he never saw her beauty. Another interpretation that he, he was, they were so holy that he didn't look at her beauty. He looked at her soul. He looked at her midot, at her characteristics. He didn't look at her body and her, and her physical look. But nevertheless, when he says, the Neshet Chayl, it's referring to Sarah. When he says, Atayat dati ki yafat mar'e. Yafat mar'e is beautiful, but it can be also that the inside is beautiful. Not only the outside is beautiful. And then it says something so beautiful, we mentioned before, Rachok mi pninim micha, far away from the value of, of uh, pearls. And he says, you came from far away. How they say now nowadays, you came a long way. I remember you 20 years ago, 40 years ago, you came a long way. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it referring to? Micha is, uh, it can say the value from limkor, the sale. But micha is uh, the word in Hebrew, Michram, is uh, pregnancy. And Avraham Avinu felt the pain that she's not pregnant. For a husband, for a man not to have a child, okay, you know, it's one thing. Of course, the husband, the man wants a child, but for a woman not to get pregnant, not to have the ability to get pregnant, it brings a lot of sorrow on the woman. When you see, unfortunately, Lo Aleno, uh, uh, couples that they can't have a child, the husband, okay, the woman is very, very fragile, very sensitive. How, why can I, why am I getting pregnant? Ram Avinu, he related with that sorrow. 
with of Sarah, when he told her, Rachok mi pninim michra, Rachok is very long, Rachok is far. So he says, how long did you wait? Years you had to wait till you had a child. So it says that, Abraham, you know, I felt your pain. For all these years you didn't have a child, I felt your pain. Then it continues, it says, Batach balev ba'ala, again, he, uh, Abraham Avinu trusted her, he had full trust in her. This, uh, twice Abraham Avinu trusted uh, Sarah, once when they went to Mitzrayim and she was taken to Paro, and the other one when she was taken to Avimelech. First of all, he trusted her because he told her, tell her you're my sister. She could be afraid, or chas v'shalom givin, and says, no, no, it's my husband. So he trusted her and says, I trust you, just tell, you, tell, her, tell them you are my sister. But not only that, Take any average man in this planet and put him, put, take his wife away from him and put her in a beautiful palace for a month, for a week, for two months. When she comes home, the husband right away is like full of jealousy. What did you do there? Who did you look, who did you see there? What, you were hanging out there with the king? You went to all the parties? What did you do there? The men tend to be extremely jealous. You know, to nowadays the woman just answers the phone. Who are you talking to? Why are you looking at him? Why are you, who's texting you? So Avraham Avinu says, no, I, I, I trust you. I know, even though you were in, in the palace, after all, we know both with Paro and with Avimelech, the they treated her nice. They didn't throw her to a dungeon. She was in the royal suite. He trusted her. He says, Sarah Imenu, no chance. She's going to do anything that is against the Torah, something that is immoral. Next verse, it says, Gamalatu Tovelora. She has rewarded him good and not bad. And this is, of course, that Avraham Avinu realized that all the good that he has was in the schut of Sarah. This is something that uh, hard for many men to, to accept, that the bracha, the blessing and the abundance comes from the wife, not from the man. And a man that has a shefa, uh, abundance, yes, to the sense, come from the woman. And not only that, it says that if a man doesn't treat his wife nice, then he, he can't expect to have parnasa. If a man is not treating his wife nice in any way, insulting her, using her, uh, whatever, treating, mistreating her, then he shouldn't expect to have parnasa because it will uh, damage all the shefa, all the abundance, all the, the, the blessings uh, in, the, in the marriage. And a smart man, treats his wife like a queen, and that's the, where, the, where he can get his shefa. So Avraham Avinu says, Gamalatu tov I know that all the good that I had was only because of you. Anything bad that happened had nothing to do with you. Sometimes men, unfortunately, they, something goes wrong, and right away, she did it. <laughs> Look at the Adam Arishon. Uh, Kadosh Bo told him, why did you eat from the tree? She did it. Why are you right away throwing the ball to her court? Just take responsibility. And sometimes many husbands, it's because of you. I didn't do anything. What do you want from me? So Avraham Avinu recognized that the bracha comes from, uh, from the woman. Darsha tzemer u fishtim. Tzemer and fishtim is wool and linen. So there are a few interpretations of that. One of them, there is a prohibition in the Torah that is called kilaim. Kilaim is mixing two things. It can be wool and linen. It can be an ox and a donkey when, the, when you plow can be uh, two seeds, we're not allowed to mix things. This is called the sulki line, a separation between one thing and another. So first of all, one interpretation says that Sarah Imenu was in the same level of Avraham Avinu that she fulfilled the entire Torah before the Torah was given. This is su, this prohibition is from the Torah. They didn't have to do it before they got the Torah, but nevertheless it says Sarah Imenu was in a very high level, she fulfilled all the commandments of the Torah. She didn't mix wool and linen, but more nicer interpretation is if you remember, we read that last week, that the second that Yitzhak was born, she, of course there was a great joy, and then uh, it says right after that that she saw that Yitzhak and Ishmael are hanging out together. Now Yitzhak was a good boy and Ishmael was uh, not such a great guy. She saw that he's teaching, uh, that Ishmael is teaching uh, Yitzhak how to hotwire a car, how to, uh, you know, hack into credit cards, let me show you, I know a few tricks here and there. So she was like, I don't need this hoodlum uh, with my son. So right away she told uh, 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 Avram, get rid of this guy. He's spoiling my kid. So darsha tzemer ufishtim, darsha is also demand, lidrosh. She darsha, she demanded Avram Avinu, separate them. They cannot be together. It's not good when they're together. 
יצחק ונעשיו will be together, יצחק ונשמעאל will be together, אוי ואבוי what's going to happen here. ישמעאל is going to influence him, he's the big brother, and all by all now יצחק is going to become a hoodlum like him. So she demanded דרשה, צמר ופישטים, separate them, they can't be together. You know what it was for Sarah to come to Avraham Avinu and says, get rid of her. Forget about the maid servant, I mean the second wife, the son. It was a very big test for Avraham Avinu to send Ishmael out of the house. That's why Hashem had to intervene, and Hashem says, כל מה שאשתך שרה שאומרת לך, שמע בקולה. Whatever your wife Sarah tells you, you listen to her. So Avraham Avinu says, okay, Sarah said, I say amen. So Shara demanded that there will be a separation. Next it says, Haitaka Oniyat Socher, she was like a merchant ship. Uh, a ship, usually the ships are on the ocean all the time. One day you're here, one day you're there, one day you're in this dock, one day you're in this country. Same with Sarah, she was constantly moved from one place to another. Men, it's a little bit easier for them to travel and to wander around from one place to another. Many men, they move from one place to another because of their job or whatever. I can tell you from my own experience and with my own wife, of course, but for many others, women, it's very hard for them to move. Constantly, one time here, one time there, where am I going to put all my clothes, where am I going to put all my, 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 my stuff, my, my makeup, this. A woman needs to be in a very calm and settle, settling place. When a woman starts traveling too much, it's, it's very, very hard. A man just, you know, when we travel, uh, last week we went on a mini vacation, I took two shirts, two underwears, two socks. That's it, it took me three me two and a half seconds to pack. What, that's all you're taking? Well, what else do I need to take? Oh, my birth, my just brush. Wow, thanks you for reminding me. And you know, my daughter, two and a half suitcases, my wife, three and a half suitcases. What do you think, we're going for three nights? No, in case, and so, in the summer I traveled with my daughter, two, two suitcases, and when I, I told her, we, I thought we were bringing everything from the States to Israel, why are we bringing everything from Israel to the States? No, I need this, I need this, I need that. So, men travel with a, with a bag and women travel with a container. So, for, so Sarah, you know what it is for her to own this traveling and then she was taken to Paro and taken back and taken to Avimelech. And so she was like a ship, one time here, one time here, one time here, one time here, no rest. So, that's Haitako Niyat Zohar. Next, Vatakom Baod Laila. Vatakom Baod Laila, that she woke up very late at night. So when it's referring to that she woke up late at night, what, she had amnesia? Not amnesia, uh, amnesia, how do you say? Uh, insomnia? Well, she couldn't, she, she couldn't sleep. Then she woke up in the middle of the night. Was she worried about the mortgage? Well, what was the problem? When did she wake up late at night? Then... Anything that Avraham Avinu did, he asked Sarah, can I do this, can I do that, is that okay if I do this? Now, especially when it came to the educating of the kid, he told her, should we send him to this yeshiva or that yeshiva? Should he wear a, a black yarmulke or a, a regular yarmulke? What should we, which yarmulke you want the son to wear? When it came to educating the kid, she, he constantly consulted her. But now he came to the ultimate test, he has to go and sacrifice. What is he going to go to Sarah and tell her, I need to go and sacrifice the Yitzchak? Should I take the blue shirt or the white shirt? What should I wear for the occasion? He had to say, how am I going to tell her that? If I'm going to tell her that, you know what she's going to do? She's going to do anything in her power to convince me not to go. So Avraham, Avraham says, you know what? Vayashkem Avraham Baboker. I'll wake up very early in the morning. She's not I'm just going to tip, tippy toe and go out very quietly. She's not going to notice. But Sarah Imenu was a prophet. That night she couldn't sleep. Remember I told you last week the greatness of Avraham Avinu? Where do you see the greatness of Avraham Avinu in all the tests that Hashem told him, go and slaughter your, your son. And what does it say? Vayakam Avraham Baboker. And he woke up in the morning. This is where you see the greatness of Avraham Avinu. Not that he woke up early in the morning and he did the mitzvah right away. The fact that he slept the night before. What kind of a father can go to sleep when he has to slaughter the child in the morning? Any normal person will toss and turn. He is very quietly, he went to sleep, he had a nice good nap. And then he wakes up in the morning. That's his greatness. Sarah was tossing and turning. She was like, what's going on? Something is going on. So she woke up that night. She couldn't rest. She couldn't sleep. She got out of bed in the middle of the night. She says, something's bothering me. Something's going down. Something's happening. And then she sees Avraham Avinu waking up early in the morning. And she was like, where are you going? Where, where, why are you leaving early in the morning? That's not nets yet. You're not going to the minion. So that's the verse, Vatakam Bodlaila, that night she couldn't sleep. She knew something's going on. 
And not only that, Avraham Avinu always wanted the blessing of, Avra, of, of Sarah. He wouldn't do anything without her blessing. And of course, he didn't know how he's explaining to her how he's going to do this thing. So again, what talking about Laila referring for the time that uh, she couldn't sleep. Then the, ver the next verse says, Zamama uh, Sadeh Vatikacheu. And Sadeh is a field. Zamama is that she desired, or not really desired, but she really wanted. Vatikacheu, and she took it. We just learned on Sunday that Avraham Avinu, when he wanted the field, remember he, he said, oh, I want that piece of property. Now he, he didn't want to go directly to Ephron, because Ephron would tell him, oh, oh, you want the property? No problem, I want top dollar. We know that Sarah already wanted that piece of uh, property way before she died. And if you remember, we explained that on Sunday. Nobody knew where Marat HaMachpala is. If you remember the story, the Malachim, the angels came, Avraham Avinu went to slaughter three bulls, First two went into the slaughterhouse, the third one ran away. Avraham Avinu runs after the bull. The guy is 99 years old, after circumcision, and he's running after a bull. And the bull ran into Hebron, into, into Marat Machpela, and suddenly Avraham Avinu sees, wow, what's going on here? Starts smelling, a smell of Gan Eden. And then he found the cave. He saw the souls of Adam and Chava sitting there with beautiful lights surrounding them and angels. And he figured out, wow, this is the place of burial. Later on, he took Sarah and he told her, look at this beautiful place that I found. So Sarah says, I want it. I want you to put down, a call the realtor, and I want you to put down an offer. Mm -hmm. So Sarah Imenu already wanted that piece of property. Why do you think Avraham Avinu bought it? He says, you couldn't have it when you were alive. I'm going to buy it to you when you die. So it says, Zamama Sadeva Tikacheu. She really wanted that piece of land, the Sadeh, the, the, the field. But Tikacheu, she got it. When she died, she got it. <coughs> Also, when it says the, the word Vatikachehu, it's referring to that's where, where she was buried. And, and like I said, the connection started with the angels. That's when it all started. Already they had their eye on that piece of property a long, long time ago. Next verse, it says, Chagra be'oz matnea. Lachgo is when I wear a belt, I put a belt, is called in Hebrew Chagora. I put the belt and I buckle it. And usually it's to hold the pants up. Now the belts are more for fashion. But once the belt was to hold the pants from falling. This is called Lachgor. Chagra be'oz matnea. Oz is might and matnea is the, is the hips. So one interpretation says it's going on the, on the time when the angels came. And right away Hashem, eh, eh, Avraham Avinu told her, listen, we have guests. Go and eh, make eh, eh, cakes. Right? He told her, Mari Mari lushi shlosha seim. Go and make quickly cakes. So, what? so she put an apron right away. So that's one interpretation that she went in right away, didn't think too much, who's the guest, what's the guest, right away. But more than that, she, she, she right away ran to do, usually, most women, if their husband will come and tell them, listen, I have a guest staying here tonight, who is he, who do you, where do you know him, what is he, what's, what's his deal, why is he coming and crashing here tonight, how many times the husband is like, listen, I have a friend, he has to crash on the sofa tonight. Usually the women are like, no, 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 you're not bringing that bum here. No, no, he's not going to be sitting here now for three weeks and bringing beers on my couch. He's not coming here. Sarah Amenu didn't ask too many questions. Right away she, she, she jumped to the opportunity to do a mitzvah. And then it says, Ta'ama kitov sachra. She tasted that her uh, action was very, very good. And again, this is uh, 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 referring to Right after that, if you remember, there was a war with Avraham Avinu and four kings. After the whole story, Avraham Avinu goes to Zdom, Kadosh Baruch destroys Zdom. Later on, we read about a war, and Avraham Avinu goes to war against four kings. It's almost like me going now to war against uh, the American army and uh, Donald Trump, and Putin and the Russian army, and Ahmadinejad and his army, and Assad and his army. One man going against four armies for a war. So he hired 317 uh, soldiers, he paid them. And he goes out to war, and he wins. But nevertheless, again, where does the merit come from? From Sarah. So she assisted in the war. And not only that, this is one interpretation. The other one is that after that, when Avraham Avinu uh, has a dialogue with Elimelech, and Elimelech takes Sarah, Avraham Avinu, uh, of course, wants to go and save her. The Kadosh Baruch appears to him in the dream, and he tells, her, he tells him, release her. 
You know who her husband is? Her husband is a prophet. Don't mess with him. He's going to pray for you. And Abraham Avinu right away intervenes and Elimelech gives her back and he tells to Sarah, I just gave your husband a thousand shekels. Now, it's not a thousand shekels what we know of. I would say it's kind of equivalent to a billion dollars to what we have in our generation. I'm just throwing an amount. Don't, don't hold me on the dollar. But that's what it was. He bought, Abraham Avinu bought the cave for 400 shekels. And I, again, that's my interpretation that it's probably equivalent to our generation to 400 million dollars, some, some serious property. Abraham Avinu had a lot of money. But it says that Avimelech told her, I gave your husband, your, it says I gave your brother, but I gave your husband a thousand shekels. I gave him a lot of money. So again, Ta'ama Kitov Sachra. Sachra also comes from the word Mishar. Mishar is uh, willing and dealing. And she says, okay, it was worth going uh, to Avimelech for a week there. It was more than a week, but worth going there. We got a lot of money into the bank account. Next it says, Yadea Shalcha Bakishor. Yadea is her hands. Shalcha, she threw her hands out. Kishor. There's a lot of interpretations on this uh, verse. But first of all, it's referring to Yadea Shalcha, that she put her hand out. That right away, it's she, any person who went close to her, she would uh, right away give them out, hand out, whether it's a donation, a food, or whatever it is. And they had a whole uh, center, they had a hotel. Everybody would, they was on the main junction, and everybody was going backwards and forth, and they would come in, and drink, eat. Shalaymen right away, no questions asked, Yadea Shilcha Bagishor, right away she gave her hand out to anyone who needed it. But nevertheless, what's not so clear here is because Kishor is the tool that you, the, the, I don't know how it's called in English, but the tool that you use to put the wires to go through when you're weaving. This is a Kishor. It's not really a needle, but maybe a hook. Now, the, uh, the, the, the machine is that it has like a top and a bottom and has all the wires and then you have like the stick that you're going like that. It's the weaving. The, yeah, that, that's the action weaving, right. but the stick, that is called kishor. Yeah. So I don't, know, I don't know the word in English I try to find, but just imagine the machine, how you weave. You don't weave with your hand. The thread is connected to like a huge needle, but it's not really a needle, it's a stick. And you go like this, right, right. and then you finish and you... Pair it up, down, so the kishor is that little stick. So again, <clears throat> one way doesn't make much sense. What does it mean she, she, she held the stick? But nevertheless, it says kishor is, is, is a stick. So there's, there's different interpretations of what it means. But uh, what is not so clear, because right away it says, Vekapea tamcha palech. And this goes on the next verse. That it says, Kapa Parsalani, that she, her, she opened her hand to give anything to a poor person. So the interpretation says the verse doesn't much, much, make much more sense, but nevertheless, it's referring to how generous she was. She used to feed the poor, bathe uh, the, the, the sick, and dress the, the poor people. Malbisha Rumim, she was a very uh, uh, charitable and, uh, and kind woman. Then it continues, it says, Lo tira levita mishaleg. What is this uh, beita mishaleg? Lo tira, she, she didn't have any fear. Le, le be, mi beita le shaleg. What, what is this beita? It means her house, and shaleg is uh, snow. What it's referring to? It's referring to Gehenom. The Kadosh Bokhu showed Sarah Gehenom. Also Avraham Avinu, he showed them Gehenom. Because if you remember, in the covenant in Brit Ben Abtarim, Avraham Avinu had a covenant with Hashem, and Hashem showed Avraham Avinu, anyone from your offsprings, from your children, that will sin, is going to go to Genom. Avraham Avinu says, I want to see this place, where are you taking my kids? So he showed him Genom. Avraham Avinu says, whoa, whoa, that doesn't look like a nice place. The temperature is very, very high, no ventilation, no air conditioning stinks here. So Avraham Avinu says, I don't want you to take my kids to Genom. So Abraham Avinu did a, a deal with the Kadosh Baruch and says, instead of Genom, give them a, 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 a exile. Let them be in exile. Let them suffer in this world instead of suffering in the world to come. So same thing with uh, Sarah. Sarah said, you know, Abraham Avinu included every, 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 everything to Sarah. So uh, Kadosh Baruch showed Genom to Sarah. She looked inside. No, I'm not afraid of this place. I'm, I'm not worried about this place. Really? You're not worried about Gehenom? She says, no, I'm not worried. I told her, why are you not worried? He says, you know why? Ki kol beita lavu shanim. All her house is dressed, dressed with shanim. 
The Midrashes don't read it as Shanim, read it as Shnaim, two. What is this Shnaim that it's referring to? The two things, Shabbat and Milah. She says, I'm not afraid. We observe Shabbat and we circumcise our men and we guard the covenant. No chance for Genom. You observe Shabbat, you guard the covenant, you're never going to go to Genom. So she says, I'm, afraid. I'm not afraid of Genom because we have Shabbat and we have circumcision. And circumcision is not necessarily just the actual act, it's also guarding the covenant, which includes in it all the forbidden relations. And Sarah was not afraid. Why? He called Beital of Bushanim. She says, my house, we observe Shabbat in my house. I have no problem. Not only they observe Shabbat, my father, my husband circumcised himself and the kids and we're all good to go. <clears throat> Next we have Marvadi Mastala. Marvad is, is kind of like a, a, a type of clothing. And it says Marvadim Astala, she made for herself different types of clothing. Now it doesn't mean that she was a fashion designer. Rather, from her came the house of Kehuna. And the Kehuna means the priest, priesthood. And from her came uh, priests. And they were uh, wearing very special garments. Not only that, it says Marvadim Astala, Shesh Vargaman Levusha. Shesh is the, the, the right translation to Shesh is twisted fine linen. When they made the tabernacle, they, the tabernacle, there was the tent and it was covered with curtains. And the curtains were covered with beautiful colors, be uh, turquoise and purple and violet and Shesh v'argaman levusha. Shesh is that fi twisted fine linen. We don't, re don't really relate with that because in our generation you go to Gap and uh, I don't know, a children's place, you buy junk for two dollars and in the olden days fabric was one of the most uh, uh, valuable thing in, in to, merchant, to be a merchant with. My family, my father's side, going like four or five generations back, they were merchants of fabric. They were very, very, very wealthy in Lebanon, in Syria, and they used to uh, transfer fabric from place to place and, and uh, leather. Once in the olden days, if you remember, the merchants will go and if you have good, good fabric, oh, this is worth a lot of money. Uh, I mean, I, we change clothes every two or three months. We go to the shop and we buy new clothes. But in the olden days, you have a suit, you wear the suit for five years. It just doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, go bad. So the twisted fine linen is very, very expensive fabric. And the argaman is the purple. This is the color, what, one of the colors that they had in the, in the Mishkan. So when it says Marvadim Astala, first of all, priests came out of her. The priests are blessing the world, the entire world. And they have special garments. And not only that, uh, in her merit, we had the, mish the Mishkan. The Mishkan, the tabernacle, it was covered with these curtains. Not only that, that uh, when it says Marvadim Astala, it's also talking about the, the converts, the future converts. If you remember, Avram and Sarah used to convert everybody. Avram used to convert the men, Sarah used to convert the women. And not only that, they were, so to say, they're up until today, they are the father and mother of the converts. You call a convert to the Torah, it will be Ben Avraham, Ben Sarah. You pray for somebody who converted, you say Ben, ben Sarah. So Avram and Sarah are the parents of the converts to all generations, which means Marvadi Mastala that she made for herself it's referring to also the future converts, and it says, Marvadi Masta goes on the priests. So it's talking about also about the future priests, the future gerim that are future to be priests. How is that possible that a ger, that a convert can be a priest? Before I tell you how, there's a, a joke, uh, I don't know, maybe it's real even, but there was a certain individual that uh, he, he wanted to convert. No problem, he comes to the rabbi, tells him, I love Judaism, I want to become a Jew, no problem, we'll convert you. And after he converts, now I don't have to tell you what it takes to convert. This is a, sometimes can take years till they squeeze the, the last drop of, of, of hope out of the person. But nevertheless, uh, finally after years he converted. Now he goes back to the rabbi and says, finally I converted. He says, but I want to be a priest, I want to be a Kohen. The rabbi tells him, listen, you can't be a Kohen, you can't be a priest, your father has to be, you can't be a priest. 
He's like, but I want to be a priest. Isn't there like a school for priests, uh, something for Kohanim, something I can get certified? I want to be a Kohen. The rabbi tells him, sorry to tell you, I can't help you. You can't be a Kohen, you're a convert. And he tells him, I don't care, must be some type of a loophole in the Torah. I want to be a Kohen. So the rabbi tells him, why do you want to be so much a Kohen? What's the big deal? So he tells him, what are you talking about? My father was a Kohen, my grandfather was a Kohen. I want to be a Kohen. So, <laughs> so... How can a, a convert be a Kohen? Well, the convert himself can be a Kohen. But the convert will have a daughter, and she will have kids, and they can marry Kohanim. So a daughter of a convert can marry a daughter, a child, a grandchild of a convert can marry a Kohen, and then they become into the house of priests. So, excuse me? The grandchild. So it says in the Midrash, this you can find it in two different Midrashim. I told it once to somebody, they were like, I don't know where you bring that from. So there are two Midrashim, Shmot Rabbah, and specifically in chapter uh, uh, 19, and Bereshit Rabbah. Two Midrashim also, Bereshit Rabbah is in, cha in chapter 70, where it says that the grandson of Hagar uh, can, be, can be a Kohen. So again, Hagar is the wife of Avraham Avinu, and the second wife. And the grandson of Hagar can be a, a Kohen. Why? Because one generation down and the next generation can marry into a house of a Kohen. And then, because uh, let's say Hadar has a daughter and she marries a Kohen and the grandson is a Kohen. Right? Uh, next. Noda Basharim Ba'ala. Noda Basharim is that she... The, the, excuse me? Not Hagar was a convert, but the, the, the Midrash that gives the information how can a convert be a Kohen, so it gives an example that the grandson of Hagar, because why Hagar? Uh, Avraham Avinu was the one who converted, converted everybody. So the Midrash found it most appropriate to say about uh, talking about Hagar, because technically I'm sure that, uh, that Avraham Avinu converted Hagar. What, he's going to uh, uh, be with a woman that she's not from his own type? But nevertheless, th this brings into a big question because if she was converted, then Ishmael is a Jew. And then there's all sorts of uh, questions here. But nevertheless, it's not about being a Jew because we only became Jews at uh, Matan Torah. But nevertheless, it's just giving us the, the option how can a convert, the generations of a convert, become a Kohen. So next, next one is Noda uh, Bashar Imbala, that she knew uh, in the gates of her husband. What is that referring to? Then when Avraham Avinu went to Bnei Chet and he told him, I want this piece of land for the grave. Why Bnei Chet? Bnei Chet were, the, so to say, the owners of the land. And Bnei Chet made a very good, big respect to Avraham Avinu. They told him, you, Nasi Elohim, a man of God, Psh, you can take the land, do whatever you want with it. Of course we want you in here. Can you imagine the, the, the rates of the real estate, the, what, how the real estate will sky high if Avraham Avinu lives in our, in our neighborhood? So they told him, of course you take it. So Noda Basharim Bala, that she says, this is the Shar. Shar, we know that Marat HaMachpela is the gate for Shamaim. I told you already last class that all the souls go up to Shamaim through Marat HaMachpela. Any person that will die, doesn't matter where, New Zealand, Rio de Janeiro, Alaska, the, the soul has to come to Marat HaMachpela and they go up to Shamaim through Marat HaMachpela. This is a gate, gate of Shamaim, and Marat HaMachpela is the gate. So in Noda Basharim, she knew this is the gate, and she told her husband, give me this place, please. Next one, Sadin Astava Timko, and I'm just going very quick because we're running out of time. There's so much more interpretations and beautiful commentary. Maybe we'll do some other classes in the future. Sadin Astava Timko, Sadin is a sheet. It says she made a, see, a sheet and she sold it. So Sarah Imenu was not in the textile business and she didn't uh, pre, uh, uh, sell sheets. Rather, it's referring to circumcision. How is circumcision coming into this whole thing? So, Sadin is also uh, called uh, Sod. Sod is a secret. Now, Sadin and Sod has the same letters. Samech, Dalid, and the, and the, and, and the Samech and the Dalid. Now, what's a, a, a similar is the Sod has a Vav, and the Sadin has the Yud and the Nun. But nevertheless, Sod and, sin, and Sadin sounds very similar. What is, the, what is the connection? Where do we see a connection? then there is a, a Midrash Tehilim, specifically on the Tehilim uh, 25, Cafe, 
that it says Sod Hashem Lereav. There's a secret of Hashem is for the ones uh, who are fear Hashem. What's the connection between the, the secret and the sheet? Then we know that in order to do a circumcision, you have to put the baby on a sheet. Now we put it on a pillow. But uh, the pillow has to be covered with a certain sheet. I don't know when the last time you were in a Brit. Usually the women are far away. They don't see what's going on. But they put the, the, on the pillow the certain sheet and the baby has to be on a sheet. The, the stilim that says, Sod Hashem Lereav Uleyam Lacharim Lechazdo. This is in Tilim 30, 33, chapter 33, verse 18. That... Lameyachlim is for the ones who wish. So the secret of Hashem, of the ones who fear Him, are the ones who really wish. What do they wish for? Lechazdo, His grace. So that's when you receive the secrets of Hashem. And the Brit Milah is considered a secret. I mean, after all, many people ask, what's behind the Brit Milah? Are you cutting a piece of, a piece of uh, 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 skin here? So it says there's a, a great secret behind it. Who is going to be revealed the secret? The ones who really fear Hashem. You have to fear Hashem to do Brit Milah. If not, why would you do Brit Milah? Who in his right mind will do Brit Milah? Mm -hmm. Now you see in our generation, there are many people and movements, they're going against it. This is barbaric, this is prehistoric. Stop doing that. The child is eight days old. He can't stand for himself. This is not right. All these uh, uh, organizations, they're going against it. But nevertheless, you have to have fear to Hashem to do such a thing. You know how many stories you have in the Holocaust that mothers circumcised their boys that were born in the Holocaust in the camps and in Russia what they used to do, hide, it was illegal. Somebody would catch you doing a circumcision. It's a death, uh, death penalty. And people went with a, with a self-sacrifice and, and circumcising their kids in basements. You have to have fear to Hashem. But the ones who are the ones who wish for the, His grace, for the kindness of Hashem, you want to get the kindness of Hashem, it has to come first with a lot of fear to Hashem. Next, Oz Hadar Lebusha. Oz is might, Hadar is glory. She's dressed with might and glory. This is uh, referring to the clouds of glory that they were surrounded her tent. Can you imagine how it looks? The, these clouds of glory. We imagine like a cloud. I think it looked completely, completely different. I don't think it looked like a cloud. It's just called Ananei Kavod. Same thing with the camp of Israel around the, in the, the, the surrounded them in the, in the desert. So while she was alive, the clouds were surrounding around the, the tent, but it's also referring to Oz Vehadar Levusha. Oz is might, Hadar is, is glory, Levusha is covered uh, or dressed. This is referring to the reward that we get at the days, uh, in, in the end of our days. When we go to the next world, the reward we get from Torah and mitzvot. Because we know that we wear the mitzvot as garments, and we wear them. So it says about Sarah that she had so much Torah and so much mitzvot that she was covered, levusha, she was dressed with, with Torah and mitzvot, oz v'hadar. And then it ends, it says, v'tishak le'yom acharon. She laughed for the last day. Why? Because yom acharon is the, day, is the last day. It's referring to the day of death. So you know what they say, Tzohek Mishet Tzohek Acharon, the one who laughs last has the, how do you say it? The last word. La, laugh last has the laugh last, whatever it is, I don't, last, uh, word. La, last uh, word. Last. But you know, now people mock us, look how you look, you're covering your hair with that little shmata on your head, take it off, why are you dressed like this, like an old lady, why are you behaving like that, I mean, so, and you know, and we say, you laugh at me now, we'll see who's going to laugh when I'm going to be getting all these rewards and you're going to be standing in, in the back. So, so he says, yeah, wait till we get to the last day, the day of the death. And of course, this is referring to the tent of Sarah, it was a very special tent. She had the clouds of glory surrounding, the bread was fresh the whole week, the candles were lit up the whole week, and needless to say, when she died, that stopped, and when Rivka came, she replaced it. We're almost done. Pia patcha bechokma. Her mouth, she opened with wisdom. Then, uh, needless to say, referring to that uh, Eshet Chayel has wisdom coming out from her mouth. But what is it referring to? For the time that she told Avraham Avinu, uh, come, come to Hagar. Here, I have brought myself a, a servant, Hagar. Now come to her. 
And that's what it says, Pia Patcha B'Chokhmah. She was wise to do that for many different reasons. Who would in her right mind would bring a woman into her house and tell her husband, go to her. When she's 70, in her 70s, and she's bringing this young lady, and she tells to her husband, now I want you to be with her. So no woman would do such a thing. She knew exactly what she was doing. That's what it means. Pia Patcha B'Chokhmah. She opened her mouth with wisdom. Sophia Halichot Beita. Sophia is to have expectations, let's suppose, she constantly had an expectation. Halichot Beita, the ones who are walking into her house, who was she expecting every day? If you remember the Malachim come to Avraham Avinu, Avraham Avinu was 99 years old, which means that she was 89 years old. They come and they tell her that she's going to have a son. Ooh, I'm going to have a son? Every day she was waiting, when are they going to come, these angels? Because they didn't tell her exactly when. They said, Lamoed Hazeh, Ka'et Chayav Lesara Ben. They just said they didn't give a date, even though they actually told her a year from today. But she had such uh, expectations. Every day she was like looking, when, is it? when are they coming? When are they coming? When am I going to have my child? This is Sophia Lichot Beita. She was constantly had this uh, anxiously waiting. Kamu Vanea Veyashua, her sons rose and they approved her. This is uh, referring to Yitzhak Avino. There is a, a verse that says, Vatomer, and she said, Mi milele Avraham, who told Avraham that I'm going to have kids? Henika Banim, she will breastfeed a child. Who is this child, of course? Yitzhak Avino, ki yaladati ben lezkunav. Sarah said, wow, I can't believe, who is this uh, amazing God that told my husband I'm going to have a kid? She was praising Hashem. And finally, she's going to have a kid. So, Kamu Vanea, uh, Yitzchak is her son, but from Yitzchak, ooh, look what came after Yitzchak. Avraham Avinu got the message from Hashem, Yitzchak ikara lechazara. So this is the, her boys, her sons, they stood up, and they praised her forever and ever. Sarah is our mother, Sarah Imenu, she's the first one. Next one, Rabot Banut Asuchail Vat Alit Al Kurana. Many women, they did uh, amazing, but you were above them all. It can be interpreted of all the ladies that we read before, Rachel and Sarah and Rivka and Leah, eh, 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 Rivka and Leah and Yocheved and Miriam and so forth. But it's also referring to the ladies, of, and, and, and not only the ladies, but all the rest of the nations, that you were above them all. You, you were the mother of all the nations. Another interpretation, which is very, very interesting, that the woman that is kind of equivalent to Sarah is Ruth. Ruta Moavia, mm -hmm. and uh, because we know that Ruth came under the the Kanfei Shechina, the wings of the Shechina, and it says Rabot Banot Asuchai, but not a little Kulana. Many women were great, but you were, uh, went above them all. Sheker Achen Vehevel Ayofi. That no, doesn't need much of interpretation. The lie of grace and the nothingness of beauty comes to teach us how Sarah was so humble, even though she was gorgeous, beautiful, and attractive, that was, didn't play any role in her life, and teaching us that, you know, we get drawn to beautiful things in this world, but it's all fake. The beauty usually in this world is fake and has no importance to it. Nula mi priyadea, give her from the, her own uh, fruit. Give her from her own fruit, this is to, so to say, summarize the life of Sarah. That's the last verse of Eshet Chayil, summarizing that just, you know, her life was something to look, look, uh, look upon to. And the, the, the sikum, the, the conclusion of the, of the psalm is that how much we have to learn from Sarah Imeno. Uh, so much more so for ladies, but everybody, look, uh, look how much you have to learn from her. So we want, now just went very quickly, briefly, about 22 qualities that she had, much less than, I mean, much more than 22, we just went through the verses, is to, to, to as Avraham Avinu says, look how much you have to learn from this woman. What she went through, what she had to go through. No kids, test, kidnapped, they moved from one place to another. Always was humble, always was gracious and, and kind and, and opened her house to any guests and so forth. So Avraham Avinu is saying, Avraham Avinu is saying, look, look how much you have to. <laughs> One time we had a lecture and somebody was kicking the camera all the time. In the end of the class, it was on the other side. It was like, <laughs> so. 
Everybody's like, why is he moving? Oh, something, something's wrong with this guy, he keeps moving all the time. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, so to conclude, Sarah Imenu is our mother. We call her Imenu. And we always look up to our parents and we hope to learn from them. So first of all, as parents, we need to be an example to our kids that they always look up to us. And a parent, it doesn't have to be necessarily my physical children. I know a man here that he came to me not too long ago and he told me, I don't have kids. You're constantly talking about kids, about kids, and your kid, your kid will say Kaddish, your kids will do this. He said, I don't have kids. So, and I'm in my 70s. So I told him, you can have many spiritual kids. You can help many, many people to become observant and close to the Torah. These are your spiritual kids. We can also have many spiritual kids. So we always have to act like parents that we nourish and inspire and teach and, and show the, and guide. But more than that, we have to look in the life of Sarah and take from that. What can I learn from Sarah? Look what a gracious host. Look what a humble woman. Look what a, 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 a charitable woman. Look how she gave from herself so much, so selfless. How she stood always in the back. She didn't give any credit. All the credit of Ramavinu got the credit. She was like, I don't need credit. I just need the job to be done. I don't care who gets the credit. So we got a lot to learn from, from Sarah Imenu, whether you're a woman or a man. Even a man can look up and, to his mother and see so, so much great things. And needless to say how much more, I mean, what we did now is scraping the surface of the commentary interpretations of Chai Sarah, of the Eshet Chayil. But we need to take that, especially in this parasha, that the whole parasha, there's a big question. Why are you calling the parasha Chai Sarah? Call it Rivka, call it about the wedding about Yitzhak and Rivka. What is it talking about? The first two verses about Chaya, about Sarah. But specifically, it's called Chai Sarah because we read about the continuation of Rivka and Yitzhak and what came after. That's the life of Sarah, is what you do in this world that makes a difference. If I came to this world and I didn't make a difference, then why did I come here? To eat donuts? I mean, what, what did I come to do here? I have to constantly have in the back of my mind, how am I affecting the world? How am I making a huge change in the world that when I leave, they'll remember me? Don't look to be remembered or, or, or uh, uh, looked upon in a great way when you're in this world. Like I said before, the great ones are not popular in this world. Because everybody just sees the, uh, point out things that are not good or jealousy or whatever. You become great after you leave the world. All the great sages, all the great tzaddikim were known to be great after they left the world. So my, my, my uh, agenda should be is not to look great in the eyes of the world. Is what am I doing tachless? What am I doing here in this world to change the world? And I don't have to be the chief rabbi of the world. And I don't have to be a gazillionaire and all day long give charity. In my little circle, how am I affecting my kids? How am I affecting my, my neighborhood, my congregation, the, the city where I am? And each and every one of us can make a huge change in this world. And Sarah was a game changer. She was a set, a trendsetter. She, whatever she did, everything came after her. Her and Avraham Avinu was a couple. But when we want to learn something from the Torah, is our sages say, Maase avot siman lebanim. Look at what your fathers did, fathers and mothers. This should be a sign or a path, a roadmap for you. So we want to take the little that we learned about today about Sarah and apply that. And to, to the wives of the crowd, that you should strive to be an Eshet Chayil. And for the husbands in the crowd, you should uh, acknowledge how great your wife is. And to, to appreciate what you have and to, and, and to cherish that. And needless to say, you know, we, we better our midot a little bit more than what we have now. This makes the world a much better place. Needless to say, our life a much better place, but makes the world a much better place. Nezad Hashem. You should all be Eshet Chayil, and I will speak in the name of the men, and we should all be Avraham Avinu and cherish our wives and how great they are. Amen.